My name is Jude Philp. I'm Senior Curator of the Maclay Museum within the University of Sydney's museums. Um, what that means is I look after a very large variety of things, from scientific instruments to entomology, where we are today, to um, cultural objects, historic photographs and others. And I also manage a group of specialised curators who work um, really in those collections. So um, I'm one of a team looking after a very, very large collection. So one of the things we also do is generate research as well as assist researchers, and that's in part to show what, um, what's the potential of the collections we look after. So just in this one museum that started as a private museum of a single family um, and ended up at the University of Sydney for teaching and research, we have 300,000 insects and 70,000 other kinds of things, crabs, um, spiders, snakes, fish, mammals, all kinds of things. Um, and so that collection is just a, a fraction of what somewhere like the Australian Museum has. It's got millions of animals and the British Museum, millions of millions of animals through the Natural History Museum of um, London. But all of these collections are linked and they're linked through um, the foundations of biological science and classification through the Linnaean system. And in the 19th century, internationally, museums sprung up to be able to do what we can simply do by film and digital access today, to share with people the wonder of a very diverse world of animals and to understand how to classify and um, make it accessible for researchers. So this research is trying to understand the cost of that. How can you possibly afford to get an insect from southern Peru, another one from Siberia, another one from the slave coast of Africa, and actually afford all of that. And so we're looking at how this history of cooperation between institutions came up to be able to both give museums huge geographic coverage and also to understand how they could simply afford to do that. So. I'll talk about these index cards that are <laughs> sitting next to me. Um, index cards, many people don't realise the size of them, what they do in this sort of really typical library way that's a bit um, archaic now, was designed by Linnaeus, who's lived in the 1730s um, to 70s, was his productive working life. And he devised this as a way of understanding the big data he had to work with by grouping things together, making notes, tying in by... Um, bibliographies and other sorts of things and in a way that's um, partly what we're doing um, but backwards through education if you like trying to make the link with students um, and other people who work in museums how information is stored in these sorts of collections it's very esoteric you wouldn't necessarily think that that shell has a lot of information connected to it it's a particular kind of animal you can look them up on the net you can find all about nautilus shells but you might not realize that that came from a specific place at a specific time during its um, a long history one of the insects that we have for instance came from Cayenne in north south america and uh, it was a French colonial area of the 1760s. The guy who was the colonist there was on his way back to France for his holidays. It was in the middle of the British-French, another outbreak of wars. His ship got pirated by the British. All of his belongings got taken to Norfolk where there were public auctions, um, which was part of the way that the Elizabethan system of um, privateering. And in those possessions was a beetle about this big, um, which was sold to a man called Drew Drury. We, his collections also got auctioned eventually at the end of his life, and Alexander Maclay, the foundation of our insect collection, was one of the purchasers of that. So here's an insect that is part of a classification system. It's a type specimen. It's a really important specimen biologically, but it also ties us with this immense history that goes from warfare to social obligations and connections and really how do you liberate that kind of data from museum collections? That's what we're researching and one of those ways is through teaching people how to use index cards, teaching people how the diffuse methods of 
information in these specimens. One of the things that I think is wonderful about people who do do high-end statistics and mathematical calculations to understand things is that you can suddenly see on a single page relationships between collections which would take me physically three days to look at in terms of a collection like this, like to even just sort of see that data within each of the materials that I deal with that would take three days just in this room. But you can get it down to this page of equivalence and understanding and that, that ability to fold in information is just amazing. So recently with the Commerce of Natural History project, one of our researchers was building up data from just the 1870s collections, um, which mainly collections from Australia and the Pacific, um, but it was at a point when William John Maclay decided, I'm going to give the collections to the University of Sydney for teaching and research. I'm going to expand the collections in all areas of zoology. And lo and behold, when she looked at where all of the collections were coming from, it was San Francisco. I would never have expected that as a locality for so much of our collection. But when you actually look at the transactions, you find some of these amazingly different ways of seeing the collection and understanding it. The ways of knowing the world that allow you to understand that thing better that's, to me, what is really important about this kind of research because I have an obligation to um, really make the collection as information-rich as it can possibly be for everybody's use, not just mine. <laughs> Museums are one of the first takers up of digital data systems simply because being able to write like this is really complex and just physically takes a very long time, so you started to get... Um, punch cards, we used this punch card system in the 70s to try and work out the genus of different insects. The Maclay Museum is a little bit different from a museum like the Australian Museum for instance because we're much more about the history of museums as a whole. So our collections include the kinds of systems that have been used in the museum, so data sets like index cards, like punch cards the machines that those punch cards are made on, early computers are part of our collection, early slide rules and different ways of recognising so that when we see an insect that might have been collected from the 1760s and it will be described in its original publication as three lines big, we need to know that in Britain and France and Italy they had slightly different lines on rulers. It wasn't as systemised as it was Yes, it is today. So those things, the, the machines and the instruments that articulate measurement are part of our collections and give us a really interesting way into understanding how people understood insects in the past, but also how those kinds of systems function to give understanding. And this is, this is ongoing. And with each development and sophistication of different kinds of computerised technologies, you just see another advantage or another ability to do things and I cannot wait until they solve quantum stuff because you just think that is, that is really incredible, that, that would do things and liberate us to be able to understand things in ways that we simply can't today.